Hi, a very good evening to everyone. Um, we very warmly welcome you to the fourth edition of the Valley of Earth Lit Fest 2020. And we are extremely delighted to have amongst us a very well known and renowned author, Ms. Geeta Hariharan. Uh, kindly join us in welcoming her for this conversation. I'm Mugdha Sinha, and I will be your moderator for this session this evening. A very good evening to you, ma'am. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you so much, Mungda. Uh, for the benefit of the audience, uh, though, ma'am, uh, you need no introduction. You have been writing for the last three decades, and a lot of people have loved uh, your books across various genres. Uh, but still, we'd like to introduce you formally. So Geeta Hariharan is a full-time writer, currently based out of New Delhi. She was born in Coimbatore studied in Coimbatore, uh, uh, Bombay, Manila, and USA. Uh, she did her bachelor's in English literature and psychology from Bombay University, and uh, went on to do her master's in arts and communication from Connecticut University, USA. Her first novel itself became a highly acclaimed work, The Thousand Faces of Night, winning the Commonwealth Writers' Prize her first book in 1993. And thereafter, she has been absolutely unstoppable, coming out with a short story collection, The Art of Dying, various novels, The Ghost of Vasu Master, When Dreams Travel, In Times of Siege, and Fugitive Histories. She has also written several collections of essays and a travelogue, Almost Home, Cities and Places, India, from India to Palestine, Essays in Solidarity, and co-edited Battling for India, a Citizen's Reader. She has also been an activist in the sense that in 1995, she challenged the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act and got us all a, supreme, a landmark Supreme Court judgment in 1999. She is also the founder member of the Indian Writers Forum, which publishes an online magazine called Booktube, which is related to diversity in writing. Uh, Ma'am, it's such an honor and pleasure to have you with us today for this conversation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but ma'am, before we delve into the latest book that you have written, I have become the tide. Um, I don't know how to describe the book because the book is very, very intense, nuanced, um, interwoven, very lyrical, very sensitive at the same time, very metaphorical and absolutely real now. So my compliments to you for coming out with a story which uh, you know resonates with the current contemporary times that we live in today. Uh, but before we actually talk about the book, ma'am, tell us how the writing happened. Uh, this journey that you have been into the last three decades and you call yourself a full-time writer, uh, was it a corollary of your educational background? Did, uh, did you choose writing and make it happen? Or did writing choose you and continues to speak to you? Thank you, Mukda. That's a good place to start. Um, in retrospect, I can say that nobody is a full-time anything. Um, our lives uh, uh, consist of multiple identities, especially if you're a woman. Um, so, you know, I'm as much a mother as a, as a writer and as much a citizen as a, a writer. Uh, but how did it all begin? I always knew I wanted to do something uh, with the written word. My father was a journalist, so uh, perhaps that was an early uh, source of inspiration. But um, I wrote a lot of little, you know, childish um, derivative stories um, as, a, as, as I was growing up. And really, I think it was in college um, when, like all young people, you feel the need uh, to express yourself. Today, of course, uh, you have social media and so on. But those days, um, it was uh, scribbling in notebooks. What we imagined was poetry. Um, and certainly, I, I think a lot of my apprentice work was done then. Uh, it wasn't poetry, but it was very good um, sort of limbering up exercises for a lifetime of writing. Um, then, of course, in my generation, I think it was very important for us to uh, 
to have a paying job because if you were going to do certain things, live as you wanted, um, you had to be economically independent. So the job came first. Strangely enough, it was when I went away on maternity leave the first time that I began writing The Thousand Faces of Night. And I say this um, not just because it was an accident that I was on maternity leave and so on, but because the theme of women's lives, um, the underbelly of women's lives was so linked to what experience I was going through then. I was surrounded by women. And that's how it began. So when I came back from maternity leave, I didn't go back to my job in publishing. That's how it began. Uh, no, that's very interesting. I'm sure a lot of people didn't know about this aspect. Uh, Ma'am, you are a very sensitive uh, writer and an activist writer who are huge to labels and box you in, in a particular uh, fashion. But I think, uh, if, if I rightly say it this way, that you are a chronicler of contemporary times and you have always given voice to the new spectators, the passive victims the marginalized, the invisible, the often forgotten people. And if I connect the tragedy of the writing and the body of the world, the two have written up the last year, beginning of course, the question of 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 the river of your journey, if I can compare it to a river, uh, uh, with all the various communities going into it, and this becomes an issue of this current book of laws. Because in, in the other books that we have written, we've spoken about the uh, you know, uh, fault lines in the community, the gender issue in the thousand lines. Uh, and we have very, very interesting characters, protagonists in all of them. Uh, you call her baby in a thousand nights, and then you see how women don't get equal uh, amount of equal power. Uh, uh, so is, is this a very, very predictable? Do you choose your tools in a very predictable manner, knowing that, okay, let's do religion now, let's do gender now, and, uh, or, or do they go from what you see around you, as you mentioned? Uh, because I feel that there is a lot of resonance in it. it, it so well, the the first novel, uh, which is why first novels are, um, you know, full of uh, spontaneity and innocence. As I said, um, the subject just came to me. Um, I by the time I came back uh, with the new baby, I had written one entire section, and that is how the writing life began. Uh, I was very lucky because the first novel got a certain amount of recognition and then I began taking myself seriously as a writer and uh, so you lose your innocence maybe but then you make up for it with a certain sophistication and say well what is my agenda as a writer so the only perhaps the only book I have written um, where I was self-conscious about setting up exercises for myself was the collection of short stories called The Art of Dying. Um, because after The Thousand Faces of Night was published, I thought, OK, let me not become some sort of, you know, ghettoized expert on women's lives, which people were too ready to do. Um, I don't know if things have changed now. I hope they have. But certainly when my first book came out, um, you know, there was um, there was a lot of, of course, genuine um, appreciation. But there was also a slightly uh, patronizing uh, sort of, you know, OK, you're the expert on women because you're a woman. Well, obviously, uh, and it doesn't make you an expert anyway. You know, <laughs> as a writer, you're not an expert in anything. I think you're just asking questions. So um, I found I discovered through the writing of the first novel that I was good at multiple stories, at multiple voices. That was the nature of my voice. Um, and uh, these, uh, uh, so you actually discover your voice through the writing. Um, and, and for me, structure is very important. So I thought, all right, you know, I want multiple stories on stage. Uh, women who want to subvert 
uh, uh, no the norms and women who are uh, sort of, you know, bent and broken by, by norms. So if I were to look back, I would say out of my six novels, the first three, uh, The Thousand Faces of Night, The Ghosts of Asu Master, and When Dreams Travel, the real character, the real heroine is the tale, the story. So I think I was really preoccupied with um, storytelling, storytellers, and what happens to you when you listen to a story? You know, do you change? What happens to the storyteller? Do you change? And what happens to the story when it goes from, uh, you know, one person to, uh, to another? And which is very important because a lot of aspects of culture, including storytelling, when they travel, they adapt. When they travel, they mutate and they get appropriated as well. So uh, in a way, I was laying the foundations for what I, the sort of writer I would develop into, you know? Um, and then it really was within Times of Siege, which was published in 2003, that I dared to move away from the magic of um, storytelling and storytellers to the very dubious and rather unmagical reality of contemporary life. So to take it on more directly, you know, to um, look at politics in a much more overt way because the earlier novels had, I mean, when Dreams Travel, um, uh, for example, uses the Shahrazad story. So it's looking at power politics um, in a particular way. But from, in time, fugitive histories and I become the tide, really look at contemporary India in a very overt political way. Mm. Ma'am, you're right, because I think fact is, uh, as they say, stranger than fiction. So uh, uh, I think they very beautifully merge into each other, as you said. And also, I'm, uh, uh, you know, you spoke about the fact that, uh, you know, you speak in multiple stories, multiple voices. We also see that in your current book, uh, the, I Have Become the Type, where you have three, you know, stories and clients together. Uh, you know, moving back and forth between 12th century and the 21st century, interestingly, uh, uh, and you know, uh, in a very, very riveting and compelling storyline that you have, you bring out and make a very, very strong case for discriminations that arise out of caste uh, and also the resistance. Uh, so there is there is despair, but you do not leave us with despair alone because you give a lot of hope and the kind of friendships, circles, and love that happens. Uh, would you like to speak a little bit, uh, because now we are inching closer to the novel, would you like to speak a little bit about the three narrative stories and the characters that you have built in this novel that we're talking about? Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, as I said, I'm really preoccupied with, with structure because that is the uh, that is what differentiates perhaps a, a novelist from a straightforward a reporter or journalist, they bring a certain kind of immediacy and value to their writing. But what I think the novelist can do is um, say, let's look at the past, not because we want to glorify the past, not because we want to fabricate the past, not because we want to go back to the past, but because we want to look at it and understand why we are as we are in the present. You know, which is why I started with that narrative in around the 11th or 12th century, uh, because uh, in Indian history, we have had uh, movements. It's not as if people have, as you pointed out, and I'm so glad you said that, because it's not as if uh, caste um, atrocities and uh, gender um, discrimination and so on have uh, you know, broken people forever. People have been bent and broken, but they have also always resisted. It's simply that the history makers and the history writers have not recorded enough of that, perhaps, you know. Um, so I chose uh, to pick up um, something like the, uh, the, you know, movement led by Basavanna in the 12th century. Um, because I've always loved those uh, vachanas 
from the time I was um, a very young woman. So uh, it was my idea of people's uh, poetry, you know, poetry that doesn't exclude people, but speaks um, to them, but it's also people speaking them, you know, which is why Vachana, what is said. So I went back to the past for that. How did, you know, did were we always like this? Did we always divide the world into these multiple castes and subcastes, you know? Uh, and uh, was it always as ruthless and cruel and, you know, it's, it's flowing into every aspect of day-to-day -day life? And, of course, you can never look at caste separately. It's linked with gender. It's linked with class. It's linked with community later. So the hence the uh, going back to the past. Now, obviously, I'm not a historian. And of course, even historians don't have all the information on how exactly caste began, what happened, and so on. And hence poetry. You know, um, I think uh, I had to make the, the um, cattle skinner in the past, Chikka, a natural poet, a singer, for two reasons. One is that is how he learns who he is. That is how we uh, uh, describe the problem of caste and what happens to him. That's how we describe the resistance because poetry has always also been used for resistance. And finally, that is what comes down to present times. You know, as so many of our songs uh, 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 give courage to people in the present. So that was the past. And then in present times, I always want to look to the future. So the natural choice was to have young people because when we're looking at the failure, the success and the planning today for what kind of India we want, uh, we have to look at young people. So students, um, so I have three Dalit students who want to get into medicine. So we are now we are looking at a country with a constitution, unlike the 11th, 12th century. Have, have things changed? Yes. But have they changed enough? No. And so, you know, looking at their lives and what uh, problems they face today, institutional problems, personal problems, familiar problems, what are the opportunities they have? And then I needed a bridge. I needed a bridge for me to enter this stage, you know. So I have a professor, a middle class professor who teaches literature and poetry, who is opening these windows and he can't experience what either the 12th century poet did or these three students have, but he can look. He can look over their shoulders. He can express solidarity. And that's what I'm doing as the novelist. It's actually very fascinating when you talk to an author after having read the uh, novel to figure out what is going in the mind of the author with regards to the title, the structure, the poetry, uh, uh, the bridge, uh, uh, and the story, of course. Uh, and having said that, uh, this Let me interrupt you for a minute. Let me interrupt you for a minute, Mukta. In all honesty, in all honesty, a lot of the explanation, a lot of this unraveling, I think comes to the writer after, after it's written, after it's published. You think about it and, you know, when you're looking at the sixth draft or something, you say, oh, my goodness, there's a pattern here. I didn't realize I was also doing this. Um, so I don't want to romanticize and mystify, but the truth of the matter is you are aware of some layers and the other layers just, just come. And later you are able to, you know, uh, you know, we are storytellers. So we are able to uh, make up stories about the stories we wrote. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely right, ma'am, because uh, you can never touch the river twice as they say. Uh, so every time you go back and draw uh, new things, uh, you know, in terms of interpretation, in terms of how you uh, mm -hmm. do the same mm -hmm. thing. Sometimes also the dialogue between the uh, the uh, the author and the audience also, I think, helps you see things which probably you may not have imagined at the point Absolutely. of writing. Uh, 
so that also happens. discussions like these uh, i think uh, help all of us uh, uh, you know see things in a new a new light coming back to the book ma'am uh, the central of uh, uh, the narrative uh, revolves around uh, past and it's sort of embedded very strongly and very uh, 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 an accepted social construct over the centuries. Like the Muslim community, like the Muslim community, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Despite the fact that we have participation now, the gap of active social reform is uh, uh, at the ground level. Uh, uh, you know, you also mentioned something very interesting in terms of the experiences, both the physical and the psychological uh, impact that being the other uh, happens. Also, the fact that for some people, this that discrimination in society never happens. Uh, also, the fact that you know, categorically mentioned that uh, you know it is only an attempt to the other uh, to write in a very sensitive manner. The living experience. Today we are in a time when we have seen, um, you know, we all have seen, in fact, that lots of Dalit, lots of uh, people are actually coming out of their personal memoirs. Uh, you know, in fact, in the last two or three years, we suddenly seen an uh, effervescence of people writing about their personal life, like Yashika Bhatta, who is a successful journalist in New York, writing about and coming out as a Dalit. Uh, Mr. Yangbe, a uh, Harvard student, is talking about how uh, you know the black food was more important, uh, the subject of shit was more important than me and his students in Harvard. Uh, you know, then there are people who are talking about what their parents and grandparents went about. Why do you think suddenly there is so much of focus? What, what has gone wrong that we are all talking of cars? I remember if you compare the last three or four years, to mind it, and followed by followed uh, by uh, Dr. Ambedkar's undelivered speech, which later became the annihilation of past in 1936. Suddenly, after the gap of so many years, suddenly we have so much on on past and so so much of the coming out in terms of books, fiction, and non-fiction. How do you how do you how do you see? And why, why do you think this is happening? And do you think uh, in an age where people are not reading books, uh, reading books is a buying fine art, how do you think writing will make an impact or change or bring about the change that you think about that we are doing? Sorry for this well, question. Yes, but yes. yes. Um, uh, well, to begin with, you know, I think, I think of my own. Um, discovery of, uh, I, I might have read um, uh, 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 biographies earlier without even realizing um, uh, what it meant. But I remember uh, in the 70s, early 70s, coming to um, uh, Arjun Dangle's um, uh, very powerful anthology called Poison Bread, which uh, Orin Longman published uh, in translation in the early 70s and uh, uh, you know coming from a privileged uh, caste background uh, it was an eye-opener and i think um, this is uh, and i'm talking about the other side now before i talk about the i know you're asking specifically about dalits expressing themselves through uh, the arts but um, i think you know i'm more equipped to talk about the other privileged side and then i'll attempt to see, you know, say something about uh, what I think is happening. And that's very important for us to take note of. Um, so I think many of us, as we got politicized, if I may use the word, uh, for many of us, the, the um, obvious entry point tended to be uh, women's issues. Um, and it was so for me. And um, but very soon, especially in a country like India, I think you see that. Um, and for us, the Mathura rape case for my generation, uh, a, a lot of us uh, woke up and realized that you cannot look at women's issues without looking at class and caste and community. 
which um, sounds very obvious when you say it like that, but it actually in experiential terms for the privileged is a huge discovery. And as for internalizing it, it probably takes a lifetime. So that's how it was. So I think then, you know, reading uh, for many of us, obviously, um, which is why reading is important because you learn about other people, which is why films are important because you learn about other people, you see other places, you see other lives. Um, it can never replace the actual experience, needless to say, but it gives you a window, you grow, you don't remain in that little ghetto you were born by accident. So in short, you become an adult. In short, you become educated. That is really the meaning of education, not degrees. So that is what happens with the privileged. Um, so there have been valid autobiographies um, in Marathi, in, uh, then in Tamil, then excellent ones in Canada. So it's not as if we haven't had a, a very strong body of work. And a lot of it has been autobiographical, you know, what a certain kind of witness literature, which is very powerful and important. But in recent times, I can only venture to guess, but I would say that because there has been such a sharp uh, reassertion of that old fault line of caste. So the old horrors continue, but there are new forms. I mean, you think of what happened in Una, for example. You think of the fact that manual scavenging continues. Um, you know, you think of Rohit Vemhila. You think of institutional discrimination. You think of Payal Tadvi. It is endless. And it, it coexists in a horrible way with not only with communalism, not only with discrimination against Adivasis, against women, but worst of all, all dissent is being frowned upon. All dissent is being funny. All dissenters are being hounded. All dissenters are being picked up for investigation, if possible, jailed. Now, obviously, there will be a reaction. And this is where we are so proud to say that there are young people who showed us last year, for example, what poetry really is, what it can do, you know? So who said that I'm a Hindustani Muslim, hum kagaz nahi dikhayenge, hum dekhenge. You know, who actually took the past and said, this is what it means for us in the present. And then the films, you have a filmmaker like Paranjit, who uh, has, you know, they're in Tamil, but they really should be seen by every Indian who is not just revealing that these are the problems of caste, but actually fashioning a narrative of resistance. So I think students, I think various Dalit groups, I think the Safai Karamchari Andolan. So across the board, the arts and uh, people who are working on the ground, activists, are all coming together. I do think that despite things being terrible today and COVID becoming a small screen for everything getting worse, I think that simmering of resistance will not go away. So no, you're absolutely right, ma'am, uh, because uh, Ramba says that there is no other. And uh, uh, you know, this is the realization or the awakening that you're trying to uh, you know, make us all realize through your writing. But I, you know, you, uh, uh, amidst the three narratives, there are also two strands. One, of course, is the strand where you talk of uh, uh, the status quo and the discrimination. And there is also the other strand which you just touched in answering my other question. Uh, but let us, let us elaborate and talk a little bit about uh, uh, resistance and dissent. Because that is also a very, very important uh, strand in your novel. And that is what also leads us with a lot of hope for the future. You spoke about individual and institutional, uh, uh, you know, discrimination. But when we talk of uh, challenging the status quo or speaking truths to power, we see that often the resistance is more individual. And uh, the Beam Army that you mentioned in your book, or the two allies that uh, Dr. Ambedkar wanted, uh, that we should move beyond our uh, containment zone and reach out to the other others. 
uh, because for for the Dalits, there are others also in society who make these methods. Uh, that is still to happen. But uh, you know, you mentioned about uh, poetry and art as as tokens of uh, dissent and resistance. So there is graffiti, there is now standard comedy, mentioned films. Uh, uh, you know, and we've had this dissent right from the time of Kares and Bob Marley. And we are just only adding to this popular culture where. Uh, you know, probably in times to come, maybe the hunter will not be writing uh, history and storytelling will be writing the subaltern span of history. Uh, uh, so, would you like to elaborate on uh, on this? You know, coming together of popular culture and uh, you know building up a hierarchy, uh, the other hierarchy. Uh, my only problem, the my only uh, you know sense is that you know, uh, be it religion, be it uh, you know writing. There, there is there is a tradition of mainstream and there is a tradition of things at the periphery. You know, you know very nicely call them popular. Will the two strands ever merge in the tide and become one? Is my question. Well, you know, um, history shows us that a lot of the popular. I mean, Shakespeare was actually popular theatre, and then it became uh, quote unquote classical. Uh, when it starts excluding people, when it gets enclosed in a theater with high price tickets, uh, uh, you know, it loses its, its um, inherent um, uh, democratic uh, quality of theater. Uh, I think uh, if I may go back to your question about poetry and song, for me, this was really uh, a discovery I made as I was writing the novel. And I... Uh, I, of course, was struggling with other technical problems, such as how to write this in English and so on, which I won't get into because, you know, that's a separate uh, a, a novel altogether. But I thought to myself that, is this too simple? What is poetry? Does it have to be cryptic? Then, which is why I, I spoke about the Vachana in the beginning. So um, if you if you look at the origins of, of uh, music and poetry. What was it? It was really for work. So like Satya's mother in the novel uh, sings, uh, she and her uh, friends sing as they're working in the fields. So uh, the, the function of music and poetry is, is to make the work easier. It is a group activity. It is a collective kind of um, uh, resource, you know? At the same time, it allows you to express your individual pain and joy and so on. It does that as well. But it also is a rallying thing. And that is why I have this whole uh, motif of the drum in the book. You know, so um, other than the fact that the caste system uh, forced uh, certain castes uh, uh, to to you know be the drums and 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 even the drum was ascribed a caste and of course there's the leather and so on. So honestly, it's uh, this seems to be uh, an Indian invention that permeates every every aspect of um, existence. So I wanted to look at what really is poetry and who uh, music and who owns it and who are the producers, you know, and who are the consumers. So you really see that just because something called classical uh, and, you know, it's in these fancy buildings and it's high ticketed and those people are kind of rock stars, it doesn't mean that only that is music when one small island listens to it. A lot of us grew up, you know, um, uh, loving Carnatic music because of, you know, where we were born. But again that is part of becoming an adult in this particular country where it's not one mainstream and one counter narrative there are multiple mainstreams and there are multiple counter narratives so there's a continuous not just negotiation and transaction but continuous hostility is going on so i think you know that that is the crowd we live in and where every day you have to take a position and, and see what is the right alliance for the moment. So I think not just as novelist, but as citizen. Yeah, we live in an age, ma'am, where uh, 
uh, we embrace uh, love and plurality and diversity and when it comes to trade and economics we talk of the comparative advantage of being uh, global uh, citizens uh, being interdependent and interconnected with the world uh, we also use uh, uh, you know vasudeva kutumbakam as our uh, you know tagline to move out into the world but at another level we also live in an age of social media and uh, a lot of trolling that happens we also live in an age where uh, acceptance of diversity can lead to uh, love jihad it can also lead to tanish having to pull down its ad uh, uh, so in this age uh, uh, particular age you know you are almost like tagore walking it alone uh becoming the tide but you one is not very sure whether the tide will ebb and disappear or you will need several of those uh you know tides to, tides to keep flowing through the crests and puffs uh uh to stand up erect uh, and be the sea you know we also saw in covid that uh, the migrant laborers uh you know laborers who were moving from one place to the other face mm -hmm. so much of uh, so you know uh, how how do you see this uh, you know uh, when it comes to our self interest we want h1 b1 visas to be given to indians uh, but at a very uh, you know at a very universal level we are not able to accept the massive advance yeah let me let me stay firmly uh, in india you know if people want to go elsewhere um, i think well let them go elsewhere but um because people are free to go live as long as you engage with the uh, place you're in what i want to sum up and say is that uh, my little lesson as uh, you know through the writing through the reading through the teaching um through just living um and hopefully engaging as much as i can uh with the world around me is that at the current moment what is the most important thing at the individual level and at the collective level at both levels i think what is most important is dissent and what do i mean by dissent i think at the individual level what i mean is something quite modest nothing brave you know i don't think uh, you know any of us is really cut out to be heroic what i mean by dissent is do your job with honesty so like the man in the novel he's researching uh poetry and he says this poetry was written by a dalit and he gets killed you know killed for it but uh the point is he does his job with honesty it doesn't matter what caste he belongs to what class he belongs to he's doing that that is his dissent similarly you know if you have a, a so whether it's a teacher whether it's a student a student must ask questions isn't it that's part of learning so as a writer i must speak up when i see something as you know so this is if if we have individuals doing their jobs without getting frightened you know without succumbing then we can actually have hope for collective dissent and then of course we must be led by the people who have actually been at the receiving end of this dispensation and we can only express solidarity that's how i would sum it up no that's right ma'am because even the likes of mansel and also mandela said that this sound is very very important for team building and you have mentioned a very small incident in your book where you shown that a classmate of uh, 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 anadeva is actually thrown out of the class because he asked a question uh, he does not want to accept the status so uh, uh, no. but we are keeping the last we were keeping the last uh, the best for the last which is the lyrical and the metaphorical quality of the book and the uh, you know the title uh, that we have uh, taken from uh, a beautiful poem uh, anonymous poem i have become the guide by ajeev uh, gawar and very beautiful translated by them parve and elinor as you look um i would like you to at this point read something uh, from the book uh, or talk about the poetry and how how you came across the poetry and how you decided uh, to use the title because i think uh, uh, one of the other qualities of the book that i found very interesting is uh, apart from the time travel that happens between the various uh, uh, 
uh, you know, stands in the market is also the way you have, uh, you know, used uh, use poetry and metaphor. And if I can just read one line to tell our audience, uh, uh, this is not poetry, but this is how you, uh, you know, pick up the uh, lived experience of things uh, and make that very nice discrimination between uh, uh, we and them. And this is one of the characters which says, they hate us, they love the cow. But can they love the cow like we do? Uh, and then you again have somewhere in the chapter where you talk of, uh, you know, making the uh, uh, river a, a, a legal entity. But how about making the river a friend, a child? Uh, uh, so I think uh, something about that, the law and the reality, lived experience. Well, let me let me just start with saying that um, the uh, uh, title I have become the tide is from the English translation of uh, J.V. Pawar's uh, poem, and of course it's appropriate that J.V. Pawar uh, sits there um, in the background uh, of this novel because he was one of the co-founders of the Dalit Panthers. Um, so that's important to say. And uh, he was most generous when I asked him if I may use the title. But uh, I'm not a poet, but I have to say it was a great adventure uh, for me to write these. All the uh, poems are my own except for those I quote. Um, uh, Rokades, for example, from the Marathi translation. What I wanted to do was again through the uh, the poetry, um, sort of uh, uh, one is express the the um, uh, the personal what it feels like to be discriminated against, but um, also. Uh, look at what is this homely wisdom of the people, so in a way. Uh, let caste grow into the uh, working class experience as well. So let me just, so uh, I have, uh, this is from the 12th century poet, Chikaya. So the generous river before him, the loving drum by him, help him go further all the way back. In a past life, I was untouchable. In a past life, they smelt my shadow and fled. In a past life, the meat I ate was rotten. In a past life, I bathed in a stagnant pond. That was the past. Tie me, tether me, so I don't stray there again. Keep me here in current and whirlpool, O river of a thousand faces. So you have that sort of um, poem where you know the individual so a uh, uh, move uh, to to uh, to build a measure of self-esteem to uh, say you know I have rights and I was you know uh, uh, work to 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 get them but you also have um, this and this is what the professor discovers uh, the value of this homely wisdom what is this mystery? That one asks, looking into the distance. This one looks for life in his navel. What mystery is this? Find a heap of rice, peel the husk of each grain. That fish, remove all its fine bones. That God playing hide and seek, make him your friend. The rice and fish to be grown and caught, cooked, the children fed. That friend of friends to be held close. There and the cloth to be woven, the fields to be planted, the goats to be slaughtered, the cows to be skinned, the rats to be caught, the shit to be carried away, the bodies to be loved, the songs to be sung, the stories to be told. You'll find it there, your mystery. You'll find it there, my Lord's mystery. So this is, you know, I, uh, for me, it was an education writing these. <laughs> No, actually, you've uh, uh, really stimulated us with this lovely uh, conversation. And I think to all our very, very discerning audience who are watching this program, I'm sure that uh, uh, you are provoked and stimulated in many ways uh, to go read the book and uh, enjoy what it brings, the awakening uh, about what is happening in and around us. So thank you very much, ma'am. It was, uh, it was to use 
uh, use uh, uh, the title of one of your chapters. It was only a fistful of conversation, and we have so many thousands <laughs> of uh, shades to your novel to discover, and this conversation can continue. Uh, but I think it is time for us to bring this uh, session to a close with profound gratitude. I thank you very, very much on behalf of myself and our you. audience and all of the value of work. And we would now like to throw uh, the session open for audience questions. Now. Thank you very much once again. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so after this very, very riveting uh, conversation with ma'am, it's now time for the audience questions. And ma'am, we have uh, a few questions which have popped up on my screen. So I'll begin with the first question. Uh, the first question is, what is the possibility of a transcendent tide of revolution today? I'm not sure what uh, uh, a transcendent tide might be. Uh, I think, though, that we are seeing a, a, a tide, a simmering of um, of anger, uh, of justifiable anger, of anger against injustices, against inequality, uh, all of which actually have been exaggerated and, um, you know, very, very clearly highlighted by the present COVID situation. So whether it is um, migrant workers, whether it is uh, shopkeepers, um, small self-employed uh, businessmen, uh, students who are on the wrong side of the digital divide, we are seeing that we live in a terribly unequal world. And I think the anger about this and the deep-seated desire to do something about it will actually can only rise the the time that began last year with the anti-ca protests mm -hmm. uh, i have some more questions coming up uh, 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 so this question you know it's a very interesting question in many ways that it wants to delve into your interests in your first novel uh, that really impacted you uh, so it's like a gk kind of a question I'm sorry, you'll have to repeat that last part. Uh, so there is this uh, question which has popped up, which says, what was your first novel that impacted you the most? <laughs> you know, the uh, the fact that it's a first novel, uh, everything is, is a discovery. Uh, everything is exciting. Everything is frightening. Uh, which is which is the nature of the the first experience. Uh, I think really what I learned and discovered because learning might be a, a sound like a boring word. What I discovered through the first novel is that my voice is best expressed through multiple stories, multiple narratives, um, multiple voices, and I think that was a huge discovery because each of us, you know that you have discovered your voice when you find a strategy to tell the stories that you want to tell. And that's that's what I discovered through the Thousand Faces of Night, that I would always write in plural terms. No, I think, ma'am, what uh, 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 the question wants to know, the is what was the first novel that impacted you something that you read apart from your own that made a huge impact on you you know at my age it would be really hard to remember what was the first. um there have been so many influences you know uh, ak ramanujan had a lovely line uh, what do i have that i have not received um so uh, in effect, all of us are sort of patchwork quilts of so many things we've heard and read and so on. Um, I think, um, you know, when I think about it, there's just such a huge number. I think um, uh, Italo Calvino's work, I think uh, Mahashweta Devi's work, um, I think uh, J.M. Kutsia's work. Um, also discovering uh, in a multilingual country, that you have access to translations, um, not just in our from our own country, 
But, um, well, actually, I can come up with a specific novel. I was about 70 in college in Bombay, and I went down the lane and found one of those hole-in-the-wall bookshops, and I discovered a Japanese writer called Yasunari Kawabata. Slim novels. And for me, it was a discovery because we were forced to read uh, all these um, uh, novels and uh, literature by white uh, males from England. And suddenly, to read a completely different sensibility was an eye opener for me. So, Kawabata, if young people want to look at his work. You spoke about uh, translation, ma'am, and I have two questions uh, from the audience which speak uh, uh, something on those lines. So I will ask uh, uh, you the first question uh, where somebody wants to know a bit about translation of poetry. Because you've used a lot of metaphor and a lot of uh, lyrical, uh, uh, you know, poems your own and also quoted from uh, famous poets. Uh, so the audience wants to know a little bit about your sense of translation of poetry. Um, I'm not a translator, I must say immediately, though of course um, all of us must have strong views on translation, as I said, because we live in a multilingual country and um, uh, translation is actually both literally and metaphorically a very important part of our experience in today's world. Um, I, in, in my novel, I've become the tide. I have uh, quoted uh, one or two translations. In fact, the title, I have become the tide, is uh, from the translation of uh, J.V. Pawar, uh, the Marathi poet's um, uh, poem. And um, translation is one of those fascinating exercises where forever you can have discussions about whether you should remain, whether fidelity is the most important thing or whether uh, you need to also create as you are translating. And nowhere does this come out more sharply than in the case of poetry. Um, and, you know, which is perhaps why, a, say, A.K. Uh, Ramanujan's uh, uh, translation of the Vachanas, um, uh, the medieval uh, Kannada verse, sounds so contemporary and so poetic because he himself was a poet. So uh, this is this is uh, one important thing to remember. But, you know, I would say on the whole that even if there are problems with the translation, the trick is to read multiple translations of the same text. And then you put all the hints you get of the original together because you're never going to get the original in a translation. But what a loss, what a loss if you do not have the translation. Now, translations also give you a sense of how uh, the author and the audience interact through different interpretations of the same verse. Uh, now, uh, another question that has popped us is that uh, since you mentioned Basavna, what poetry would you enjoy? You know, my theory, uh, completely unfounded <laughs> and untested except on myself, is that you begin life with a, a, an immediate a gut response to poetry, which is why um, not only do you love verse when you're a child, because you like to recite things, even nonsense verse, but also when you are young and in college, um, at least in my times, I don't believe it's changed all that much you tend to write what you think is poetry because really what you're doing is writing notes for yourself about uh, the, the feelings you have, uh, about your place in the world, about the world around you and so on. Um, you know, your first love, your first disillusionment and so on and so forth. Uh, but they really are notes for the self, but you are involved in, in a form of poetry. And in my case, I think I strayed away because I discovered this exciting world of the novel. It's like, um, you know, at the, at the prime of your life, you're very happy to have a large house with many rooms. Um, uh, but towards the end of your life, as you get older, you go back to that, the essential nature of things. So you tend to come back to poetry that with one image you can express 
what you feel, what the world feels, what the season is, and so forth. Um, and again, since I mentioned Kababata, I must tell you a very interesting story. As he grew older, he was obsessed with distilling one of his novels called Snow Country in translation. He distilled it into a short story, you know, then he made it even shorter, you know, till it became what is called a palm of the hand story. So this was his challenge. How do you take that entire novel and distill it, you know, and make a kind of um, find its kernel? And, and that, of course, is what, in a way, the poem is. No, exactly. Brevity is the wit of the soul, as author of the poem, I guess. Uh, coming back to the book after these uh, few generic questions, which of the characters in the book did you feel most connected to? Well, you know, I don't want to write a book without young people in it because that's that's what i'm interested in you know so all right we're talking about the past but the past is only valuable for us in so far as it tells us how we got to the present and the present gains meaning not only because we're living in it but also makes way for the future so if we didn't have young people in the book you know um in a way it would be as if there is no hope because that is what you want. You want young people to have more choices. You want them to have a better India, a better world. And um, so I would say I felt closest, though I am most like Professor Krishna, because he's the bridge that I am getting into this um, uh, fictitious world. Uh, but I felt closest uh, to the to the children. I felt closest to Satya. I think you know. Uh, I found myself in tears as as he uh, decides to commit suicide. No, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, uh, we have some more questions, but uh, unfortunately, our time for this session is up. So uh, we will have to leave it at that. And. Uh, so thank you very much, ma'am, for being with us uh, today for this lovely, very, very interactive uh, session uh, on your book uh, uh, published in 2019, I Have Become the Tide. And I'm sure the audience has also really enjoyed this uh, conversation with the author, Ms. Geeta Hariharan. As we thank her, I will also be extending a very, very warm thank you to all the audiences who have joined us virtually for this session. So thank you thank very you. much, ma'am. Thank you. And any questions I couldn't answer can always be sent to my website. Thank you. Thank you, Mukta. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am.